the thing you mentioned about Hal is the intuition that a lot of the people, at least in the artificial intelligence world, had and have, I think. They don't make it explicit, but that if you increase the power of computation, naturally consciousness will emerge. Yes, I think that's what they think. But basically that's because they can't think of anything else. Well, that's right. And so it's a reasonable thing. I mean, you think, what the brain do? Well, it does do a lot of computation. I think most of what you actually call computation is, is done by the cerebellum. I mean, this is one of the things that people don't much mention. I mean, I come to this subject from the outside and certain things strike me, which you hardly ever hear mentioned. I mean, you hear it mentioned about the left-right business. The, when you move your right arm, that's your, yes. the left side of the brain and, yes. and so on and all that sort of stuff. And it's more than that. If you, you have these plots of different parts of the brain, there, there are two of these, these things called the homunculi, which you see these pictures of a distorted human figure mm -hmm. and uh, showing different parts of the brain controlling different parts of the body. And it's not simply things like, okay, the right hand is controlled and sense, both sensory and motor on the left side, left hand on the right side. It's more than that. Vision is at the back, basically. Your feet at the top. I mean, it's as though it's about the worst organization you can imagine. <laughs> right, yeah. So it can't just be a mistake in nature. There's something going on there. And this is made more pronounced when you think of the cerebellum. The cerebellum has, when I was first thinking about these things, I was told that it had half as many neurons or something like that, comparable. But now they tell me it's got far more neurons than the cere cerebrum. The cerebrum is this sort of convoluted thing at the top people always talk about. Cerebellum is this thing that just looks a bit like a ball of wool right at the back underneath. Yeah. Yeah. It's got more neurons. It's got more connections. Computationally, it's got much more going on than this from the cerebrum. But as far as we know, although it's slightly controversial, the cerebellum is entirely unconscious. So the actions, you have a pianist who plays an incredible piece of music and you think of, and he moves his little finger into this little key to get it hit at just the right moment. Does he or she consciously will that movement? No. Okay, the consciousness is coming in. It's probably to do with the feeling of uh, the piece of music that's being performed and that sort of thing which is going on. But the details of what's going on are controlled. I would think almost entirely by the cerebellum. That's where you have this precision and, and the, the really detailed... Once you get... I mean, you think of a tennis player or something. Does that tennis player think exactly how to... Which, which muscle should be moved in what direction and so on? No, of course not. But he or she will maybe think, well, if the ball is angled in such a way in that corner, that will be tricky for the opponent. And the details of that are all done largely with the cerebellum. Because that's where all the precise motions, but it's unconscious. So why is it interesting to you that so much computation is done in the cerebellum and yet it is unconscious? Because it doesn't, it's, it's the view that somehow it's computation ah. which is producing the consciousness. And it's here you have an incredible amount of computation going on. And as far as we know, it's completely unconscious. So why, what's the difference? And I think it's an important thing. What's the difference? <clears throat> Why is the cerebrum, well, all this very peculiar stuff that very hard to see on a computational perspective, like having the everything have to cross over onto the other side and do something which looks completely inefficient. And you've got funny things like the frontal lobe and the protile, whatever you call the lobes, and the place where they come together. Mm -hmm. You have the different parts, the control, you see one to do with motor and the other to do with sensory. And they're sort of opposite each other rather than being connected by, new, by, it's not as though you've got electrical circuits. There's something else going on there. So it's it, it just the idea that it's like a complicated computer just seems to me to be completely missing the point. There must be a lot of computation going on but the cerebellum seems to be much better at doing that than the cerebrum is. 
So for sure, I think what explains it, it's is as like half hope and half we don't know what's going on. And therefore, <laughs> yeah. from the computer science perspective, you hope that a Turing machine can be perfectly, can yeah. achieve general intelligence. Well, you have this wonderful thing about Turing and uh, Gödel and Church and Curry and various people, particularly Turing, and I guess Post was the other one. These people who <clears throat> developed the idea of what a computation is. And there were different ideas of what a computation, it developed differently. I mean, Church's way of doing it was very different from Turing's. But then they were shown to be equivalent. And so the view emerged that what we mean by a computation is a very clear concept. And one of the wonderful things that Turing did was to show that you could have what we call the universal Turing machine. It, you just have to have a certain finite device. Okay, it has to have an unlimited storage space, which is accessible to it. But the actual computation, if you like, is performed by this one universal device. And so the view comes away, well, you have this universal Turing machine, and maybe the, the brain is something like that, a universal Turing machine, and it's got maybe not an unlimited storage, but a huge storage accessible to it. And this model is one which is what's used in ordinary computation. It's a very powerful model. And the universalness of computation is very useful. You can have some problem and you may not see immediately how to put it onto a computer, but if it is something of that nature, then uh, there are all sorts of sub-programs and subroutines and all the... I mean, I learned a little bit of computing when, when, I, was, <laughs> when I was a student, but not very much. But uh, it was enough to get the general ideas. And there's something really pleasant about a formal system like that, yeah, where you can start discussing about what's provable, what's not, these kinds of things. And you've got a notion, which is an absolute notion, this notion of computability. And you computability, can address yeah. when things are, what mathematical problems are computably solvable and what aren't. So, and it's a very beautiful area of mathematics, and it's a very powerful area of mathematics, and it underlies the whole sort of, I want to say, like the principles of computing machines that we have today. Could you say what is Gato's incompleteness theorem and how does it, maybe also say, is it heartbreaking <laughs> to you? And uh, how does it interfere with this notion of computation and well, you see, yeah. consciousness? Sure. Well, the ideas, basically, are ideas which I formulated in my first year as a graduate student in Cambridge. I did my undergraduate work in mathematics in London, and I had a colleague, Ian Percival. We used to discuss things like computational and logical systems quite a lot. I'd heard about Gödel's theorem. I was a bit worried by the idea that it seemed to say there were things in mathematics that you could never prove. And so when I went to Cambridge as a graduate student, I went to various courses. You see, I was doing pure mathematics. I was doing algebraic geometry, of a sort, a little bit different from well, my supervisor and people, <laughs> but it was <laughs> algebraic geometry. Yeah. And uh, I was interested, I got particularly interested in three lecture courses that were nothing to do with what I was supposed to be doing. One was a course by Hermann Bondy on Einstein's general theory of relativity, which was a beautiful course. He was a, an amazing lecturer, brought these things alive, absolutely. Another was a course on quantum mechanics given by the great physicist Paul Dirac. Mm -hmm. Very beautiful course in a completely different way. <laughs> it was, he was very kind of organized and never got excited about anything, seemingly. <laughs> and, uh, but it was extremely well put together and I've, I found that amazing too. The third course that was nothing to do with what I should be doing was a course on mathematical logic. I got, as I say, my, my discussions with Ian Percival. Was the incompleteness theorem already deeply within mathematical logic space? Was, was Were you introduced? I was to introduced it? to it in detail by the course by, by Steen. And he, it was two things he described which were very fundamental to my understanding. One was Turing machines and the whole idea of computability and all that. So that was all very much part of the course. The other one was the Gödel theorem. 
And it wasn't what I was afraid it was, to tell you there were things in mathematics you couldn't prove. It was, basically. And he phrased it in a way which often people didn't. And if you read Douglas Hoff's status book, he doesn't, you see. But Steen made it very clear. And also in a, in a sort of public lecture that he gave to a mathematical, I think maybe the Adams Society, one of the mathematical undergraduate societies, and he made this point again very clearly. But if you've got a formal system of proof, so suppose what you mean by proof is something which you could check with a computer. So to say whether you've got it right or not, you've got a lot of steps. Have you carried this computational procedure, well, following the proof, steps of the proof correctly, that can be checked by a, an algorithm, by, by a computer. So that's the key thing. Now what you have to, now you see, is, is this any good? If you've got a, a, an algorithmic system, which claims to say, yes, this is right, no, this, you've proved it correctly, this is true. If you've proved it, if you made a mistake, it doesn't say it's true or false, but if, you have, if you've done it right, then the conclusion you've come to is correct. Now you say, why do you believe it's correct? Because you've looked at the rules and you said, well, okay, that one's all right. Yeah, that one's all right. What about that? Oh, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, I see. I see why it's all right. Okay. You go through all the rules. You say, yes, following those rules, if it says, yes, it's true, it is true. So you've got to make sure that these rules are ones that you trust. Is, if you follow the rules and it says it's a proof, is the result actually true? Right. And that your belief that it's true depends upon looking at the rules and understanding them. Now, what Gödel shows that if you have such a system, then you can construct a statement of the very kind that it's supposed to look at, a mathematical statement, and you can see by the way it's constructed and what it means that it's true, but not provable by the rules that you've been given. And it depends on your trust in the rules. Do you believe that the rules only give you truths? If you believe the rules only give you truths, then you believe this other statement is also true. I found this absolutely mind-blowing. When I saw this, it blew my, you know, blew my mind. Mm. I thought, my God, you can see that this statement is true. It's as good as any proof, because it only depends on your belief in the reliability of the proof procedure, that's all it is, and understanding that the coding is done correctly, and it enables you to transcend that system. So whatever system you have, as long as you can understand what it's doing and why you believe it only gives you truths, then you can see beyond that system. Now, how do you see beyond it? What is it that enables you to transcend that system? Well, it's your understanding of what the system is actually saying and what the statement that you've constructed is actually saying. So it's this quality of understanding, whatever it is, which is not governed by rules. It's not a computational procedure. So this idea of understanding is not going to be within the rules of the, the, the within the formal system. Yes, you're only that using those rules human. anyway, yeah. because you have understood them to be rules which only give you truths. There'd be no point in it otherwise. I mean, people say, well, okay, this is, well, uh, one set of rules as good as any other. Well, it's not true, you see. You have to understand what the rules mean. And why does that understanding of the mean give you something beyond the rules themselves? And that's, that's what it was. That's what blew my mind. It's somehow understanding why the rules give you truths enables you to transcend the rules.